Dad Yost is here from Lightning Labs. Uh, he's going to talk about model invoices, uh, contributor to L&D. Uh, very grateful that he's come to speak to us. Uh, so please welcome Yost from Lightning Labs. Um, yeah, so my name is Joost, um, Michael introduced me already. Um, I've been working with Lightning Labs since the uh, middle of last year, and uh, during that time I worked on several pro <coughs> projects, like sub-projects within, within L&D. So L&D is the Lightning implementation that is developed by Lightning Labs. I'm, I'm not sure really what the background knowledge is at, the, at this point in this uh, three-day three -day course, so um, one of those sub-projects within L&D is called Hodel Invoices, and uh, this is the, the topic that I would like to talk about today. I've got a few slides prepared, but I'm also going to uh, draw on the whiteboard and take questions, make sure that it all lands within the model that you all currently have of uh, how Lightning works and perhaps also how, how L&D works. Um, yeah, so if you've got any questions, just feel free to interrupt and ask. We can discuss things, and also if um, I trigger something that you know is a little bit related uh, to what we're talking about. I'm happy to go into that as well uh, when we are talking talking about these uh, topics. So yeah, so whole invoices. So I, I can explain this on different levels. So obviously there is the why. Why do we have whole whole invoices? What can you do with it? Um, there is the whole invoice on the level of the protocol. So what's what's happening on the net on the network layer if you do a hodl invoice. And there's also something to be said about the way we actually implemented this in, in L and D and the, the different trade-offs that are there. Um, work that is still to be done there because we basically just release whole invoices um, in, in a minimum like in a minimum shape. So there's a lot to improve on that uh, too. So I will go over to the whiteboard and just draw Basic, basic diagram. Um, see how it goes. So a hodl invoice. Basically, it is nothing new. It is exactly the same as a regular invoice. The only thing that is different is the timing. So the timing when the invoice is actually settled. And uh, to understand how this works, is suppose we've got a a, a three-hop route. So this is the, the sender of the payment. It sends an HTLC to op1, op1 forwards the HTLC to op2, and op3, uh, op2 forwards the HTLC to the final node. So, if I say HTLC, um, does everyone know what it is at this point? Hash time of contract. Yeah, so this has been introduced. So, what normally happens is that um, the sender sends the HTLC, um, op1 knows that. Given the pre-image, they can pull this money over, so they are willing to hand out their HCLC, and in this way they build a chain until they get to the final destination. And what normally happens is when it gets to the final destination, um, the HCLC chain has arrived at the point where the pre-image is actually known. So the idea is that all these guys, they, they don't know what the pre-image of the HCLC is, because if they would, they would actually shortcut the payment. So if you would make a payment, uh, uh, tied to a hash of which the intermediate nodes know the pre-image, um, your HLC might never reach the intended destination because, for example, this node could just say, all right, I've got the pre-image, I pull in the money, I'm not going to forward anymore, and basically you lost your money to, to someone else. So it's important that the pre-image is secret, and normally in, uh, in Lightning, the final destination of the payment only knows the pre-image. So one, once the HLC gets there, um, this node, this final node, is going to disclose the pre-image, pull in the money, and by doing this, it atomically reveals the pre-image to uh, this hop number two. It, using the pre-image, it also pulls the money from hop number one, and hop number one pulls the money from the from the sender. Um, and that makes the circle round, and the payment has been completed. So what, and, and this is something that happens completely automatically. So inside the node software, this HLC is received. There is a database that contains all the invoices 
uh, and the pre-images that belong to these, those invoices. And um, what the recipient does is it does a lookup, it finds the pre-image and it pulls in the money. You don't need to do anything for that. You don't need to be at home. You need to be online, of course, but you don't need to be at home. It's all automatic. And the only thing that's really changing here with an HODL invoice is that at the sender, this receiver, R, is not immediately pulling in the money. So he might know the pre-image, but he's not yet pulling the money to allow a certain window of a size uh, that can be used to decide whether you actually want to have this money. Um, let's say a greedy recipient uh, wouldn't need all the invoices because it would always just pull the money when it gets there, but there are situations where you wouldn't want this, like for example you're a business, you're accepting a payment, but you don't just want to accept any payments because if you, if you accept any payments it could be that um, people call your customer service and they ask for a refund and you know it's all extra work, you don't really want that. And another reason why a business don't, wouldn't want to get a payment sometimes is if let's say a customer places an order and the, the goods are not in stock. So he made the payment already, we're going to check the inventory and at that point it, you know we're sold out and um, yeah it would be like not so convenient to make a refund, especially not if you a refund over Lightning. Because with Lightning, you may not know who is the actual person who sent you the money. This is an, this is like obfuscated for the for the recipient. So a refund is something that you want to avoid in that case. And this is where the whole invoice comes in, because what you can do with the whole invoice is just hold on, hold on. That's the joke, really. Uh, hold on to the HTLC and decide: Do I actually want uh, this payment? Yes or no. Um, you check your inventory, if you've got your, your goods, you reveal the pre-image, you pull in the money and in the end the sender will have paid. And if not, you will just cancel the payment. And if you, if you cancel the payment, these intermediate nodes, they will not get their forwarding fees. Uh, you, as you probably now know, is that these, these hubs, they, they want to have like a, a, a part of the payment, just as a compensation for their, um, for their service. And uh, if you cancel a payment, you don't reveal the pre-image, and the payment is not happening, but the fees are also not happening. So basically, cancelling an a hodl invoice is free for the sender, it's free for the recipient. Um, only those intermediate nodes, they, you could say that they have some kind of a cost, because they have locked their funds to a payment that has been hodled by the receiver for some time. Uh, and after, uh, after all, it's being cancelled, and they are nothing. Yes. So the intermediate nodes, I presume, can't tell the difference though between a HODL invoice and a, and a regular invoice. Yeah, they, they the encrypted the, the, the onion blocks, or can they see that it's different? Yeah, it's not even in the onion block really. So nobody can really see this except for the recipient. So yeah. the, uh, like there's an invoice like this encoded payment request. Yeah. At the moment, there's not a field or flag or anything to to communicate that this might be might be hold this HLC. Uh, on the protocol level, there's also nothing for this to communicate this. So these intermediate nodes. For them, it looks like any other payment, and once they forward it, they start to figure out like hmm, it takes a bit long. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's all invoice, but it could also be other reasons why it's why it's slow. Yeah. Total invoice encumbers people's bitcoins temporarily in HLCs. Uh, yeah. So how do we prevent like a DOS attack? Yeah, I, I will get I will get to that point later, okay. because there's there there are ways that you can attack. But it's important to know that all invoice is not something new, like holding an HLC. It has always been possible. Yes. Uh, the only thing that we do here is that we actually expose this as useful functionality, really. But uh, something that can happen in Lightning is we call this so-called black holes. So these are like nodes. You extend your HCLC, and then you just hear nothing back. Maybe not for an hour, not for, maybe not for a day, maybe not for two weeks. At some point, they will go past the HCLC expiry height. So that, that will force a channel close. But you know, all this time, you don't really know what's uh, what's happening, and this was already this existed already before hodl, HODL invoices has all, always existed. So you could argue that offering these kind of things on on the command line, um, possibly also in UIs, makes it easier for people to play around with this and maybe also um, behave in a way that not all routing nodes might like. But I think the most important thing is to recognize that this possibility has always existed. It's there in the protocol. Um, so if you want to do something about it, 
preventing an hotel invoice from being created is not the fix. It should be something on protocol level. Maybe senders need to pay for notes holding or, well, there are different ideas there, but not without their trade-offs because in Lightning is always, you have to be really careful that uh, nothing can be gamed, really. So if you make people pay for something and routing notes figure out that they can actually, you know, on purpose, hodl, for example, make someone pay more. So it's not so easy to, uh, to, to do that. Yeah, so um, let me go back to my table. And then it says may or may not know the preimage. Yeah. I understand the case where it doesn't know the preimage. But in the case that it does, surely it can, that node can just go on chain with a valid transaction as soon as it discovers the preimage. Uh, yes, but it will. It could try to discover it on its own, but normally it, it discovers it because its own HLC is settled off chain. But well, you're generally, generally, the Lightning Network, the pre image is shared without it going on chain. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. it's only it's only in the case where the channels are closed where the pre image would be discussed would be right. announced on chain. Yeah. So this has nothing to do with hotel invoice, but like that is how it works. If a channel closes, uh, the party uh, who has the ACLC and wants to settle it is actually creating a Bitcoin on-chain transaction that contains the pre-image and then the node software is extracting this pre-image from the on-chain transaction and using it to settle back towards the sender probably just off-chain because if one channel closes all the orders can just stay open so there are basically two ways you need to, to learn the, to learn the pre-image so it can either be like a lighting protocol message that contains the pre-image or in, in the non-happy flow and the channel is closing this is a premise that is discovered in the on-chain TX. Um, but the way you started your question about uh, like the final destination, knowing or not knowing the pre-image, these are in two, in the two variations of it. Mm -hmm. So the example that I just gave is the inventory check. In that case, the recipient knows the pre-image. It created the pre-image itself. Uh, it communicated the hash of the pre-image through the invoice to the, to the, to the buyer of the goods. Uh, and then it just uses it like as a, as, as a hook inside the process to uh, decide whether he actually wants to have this money or not. But I've got, I've got on the next slide, I've got a few examples of uh, like different use cases where they don't know the pre-image and it enables them some in interesting uh, things. Um, so I'm wondering, maybe I should do the demo first, right? Yeah, I think I make a, I make a little demo. I tried to do it with the, uh, what I wanted to do is I wanted to create a HODL invoice on my Lightning testnet node and then pay it with my app, but uh, my app is not functioning at the moment, so I think I will do it uh, CLI, unless someone has a testnet app on his phone at the moment. Not yet, so it will become more technical, it's no problem, I guess. So it might be difficult to, to actually see what's, what's all on the screen. I've got my terminal windows there, but what I'm basically going to do is I'm going to start on rack test. Uh, three instances of of LND. So it's LND, Alice, Bob, and Charlie. Um, they are actually not connected to Alice, Bob, Charlie, but it's Bob, Alice, Charlie in this case. And what I want to do is I want to have Charlie create an invoice and make Bob pay the invoice. So Bob will pay through Alice, Charlie. I first will do it with a normal invoice, and then I will show you what it looks like with a whole invoice. So on the CLI, I can make it even a bit bigger. So on the CLI, uh, I'm going to, for Charlie, I'm going to add an invoice, let's say 6,000 Satoshi. Um, what it gives me is a, a payment request. So the payment request is like all the invoice details encoded uh, and signed by the uh, person who created the invoice. So what I can do is add L CLI Alice uh, decode payment request. And you can use this command, I don't know if you looked at this already, to yeah. You can use this command to uh, decode the payment request. So which, here you can see what, what is in this in this payment request. So there's the destination there, there's the payment hash. So the payment hash in the case of the whole invoice, this is the, the thing where the um, recipient has the pre-image for and may or may not decide to, to use it. Um, the amount, and there are uh, several other fields 
um, like CLTV Expiry. I don't know if you talked about this, but um, for invoices in Lightning, when they get to the recipient, they have a requirement of like a minimum blocks still left until the expiry of the HTLC. Because what you don't really want to do is accept the payment, then you know send out the pizza, and then you you find out that you only have one block left before it expires. Um, so you really need to like hurry to go to chain and hope hope that you will claim it. Um, if you need to hurry to go to chain, like the other party might also try to play the timeout transaction, and you get involved in a race. So. In general, there's like a, a broadcast window, that's what we call this. Um, and during this broadcast window, we don't want to accept any HLCs that are already inside the broadcast window. So are that are already inside the broadcast window. So we want to have like a convenient period of time in which we can claim the HLC on chain if needed. Um, and during this window, the, our counterparty can't claim yet because this time, if they want to uh, play the timeout, they need to wait until the expiry. So. Uh, with this value, you can actually control how many blocks you want, still want to have left until expiry. So the default value in Adly is 40. So this means like when an invoice is accepted and uh, settled, we know that there are still 40 blocks left. So if something goes wrong with our channel, we've got enough time to, to claim the HCLC. And this number, like with regular invoices, usually it's left to the default. But with hotel invoices, this can be quite useful because you can put a much higher number in here meaning that the window that you have to do your additional actions is uh, can be chosen by the recipient. So if you have like an inventory check for which you need to go into the warehouse and walk around see if it's really there, uh, you might say, okay, 40 blocks is not enough, I need uh, like a full day. So using this value, you can actually configure how long, how much time uh, you have after your sender uh, offers you the HTLC and to, to decide what you want to do with it. And uh, sometimes a short, uh, short period is enough, but it could also be really long. And this is also something that some people are worried about because they say like, okay, people are going to create hotel invoices. They make it like a 1000 block uh, timeout and maybe they just forget about it or they make like it a, uh, a custom to settle them only at the very last minute. And all this time our capital is locked up in, in, in a chain of, of channels. So. Okay, but for the demo, it's set to 40. Um, this is the payment request, and if I go to Bob and I, I pay the invoice. Uh, it gives me another confirmation mission, 6,000. I make a yes, and then um, can I? So what it shows me, this is nothing hotel info specific really, but just explaining for context. So uh, it will show me the pre-image because I made the payment and in exchange for the payment, they gave me the pre-image. This is actually what I really bought. And it shows me the route that, uh, that, that was taken to complete the payment. So now, if you do this, this was a regular invoice. So it settled, as I explained, it settled automatically. If you're home or not, it doesn't really matter. It will, it will settle. Um, now I'm going to make a hotel invoice. So it's the same command for Charlie, and I do add hold invoice. And what I then need to pass in is the is the hash that it should be locked against. Because I just explained that sometimes the recipient doesn't know the preimage himself. So if I wouldn't pass in anything here, um, what could LND do? It could only generate a preimage, but then it would know the preimage. So the way this is designed is that as a as, as a caller of this function, you always need to provide a hash yourself to connect to, um, to, to tie the HTLC to. And that way you can also be sure that LND itself is never able to settle without you supplying the pre-image because we're not even passing the pre-image onto the command line. So I've got a little tool, tool here, it's called gen hash. And what it just does is like, if you run it several times, it's just generating pre-images and hashes. Uh, I use this for testing. I'm going to generate a set of, like a combination of hash and pre-image. So this hash is the hash of this number. And now I'm going to create a whole invoice type to this hash. And then final parameter is like a amount. It generates a new payment request. And if I decode this one, um, it will more or less show, show me the same things. So there's nothing in here to indicate that it is a hotel invoice. It's just a regular payment request. 
as a sender, you don't really know whether your payment is going to be hodled. This is something that, uh, like a site that sells something, could actually mention. Like, okay, uh, be aware if you pay to us, we hodl your payment for a while, so don't panic if you know you don't get the pre-image immediately. Right. So now with this one, I can go to Bob and I can pay the invoice. I confirm. Yeah. And then uh, what you see is that nothing is happening really. Because in the protocol, there's only a single round trip. So those HSDs are extended. And at some point, there's a failure or there's a settle. And the settle or the fail they are, is passed back to the sender. There's no other way to do some kind of intermediate communication. You, you can't receive, for example, an egg. So an egg that uh, the, sender, the recipient actually got the payment. So on the command line, I can look at that. So if I run on Charlie, uh, list invoices, uh, you will see that this 7000 invoice, I guess this is the same one, this is the same payment request. Yeah, it's the same payment request. So we can see that Charlie actually accepted this payment. So we have the HLC. Um, Bob can do nothing about this anymore. There's no way to cancel this for him. The HLC is with, with Charlie, and Charlie can decide what to do with this. And how to decide this, uh, it's something that's happened on the command line. Um, but before I do that, I want to explain the difficulty here is that Bob he has nothing back. And uh, with an, in the happy flow, this is what is expected. Everything is blocking. Um, only it could also be that the payment never reached Charlie, and this is kind of a difficulty because Bob doesn't really know what's going on now. Did it get there? Did it not get it there? So because we don't have like an in-protocol hack to communicate this, I think that uh, users of this functionality would use some out-of-band communication channels. So possibly on a website, they show like, all right, if we, are, we are holding your HLC, it's, it's, it, it is with us, it's all right, and we will settle soon. Happy flow is when the payment is successfully routed and the pre-image is shared along, along that route right back to the sender. Yeah, that's the full happy flow, but now we are in like halfway the happy flow, which means that the payment arrived at the recipient, uh, but we haven't decided what to do with it yet. So therefore, this window is still, is still blocking here. Um, so then for Charlie, there are actually two commands. On the, uh, on the CLI, uh, it's called Settle Invoice. And for Settle Invoice, I need to pass in the pre-image. So LND doesn't really know the pre-image, so you, you need to pass the pre-image, otherwise it will never be able to, to pull the HLC. And if I do this, you will see that uh, Bob unblocks, and it actually gets this payment confirmation. It, it looks exactly the same as, as the, uh, with the, the regular invoice, it's just the timing is different. It's different, there's this hook and uh, we're, we're delaying. So, if I would do the same thing, create another whole invoice, I would do it with a different, different hash. I will pay this. Minus F, it means no confirmation. So it's hold it again. I can do a list of invoices. Charlie, there, it's accepted. And the other thing that I can do is I can cancel the invoice. So LNCLI cancel invoice. So now I need to find my hash because cancelling you don't need to do with the pre-image because it may be that you don't even know the pre-image yourself. So cancelling is uh, done using the hash. And if you cancel this, Bob will get a unknown payment hash error. They have not really an error in which we can say we got it, we got it, but we cancelled anyway. So we reused one of the existing errors for this. It's an unknown payment hash, so it looks like the recipient didn't know the, the, the invoice, but actually it did know it, but it cancelled it afterwards. So, so how is this explanation so far connecting with what you all know? Is this sort of, yeah, sort of rematching? Yeah, if, if people like if people want to get closer to the screen to see the see the code, there's some space on these tables. So who 
feel free to move your chairs closer to the screen. The text is a bit small. What did your uh, F flag do up there? Oh, the F flag is up there. I've not seen that. Yeah, it's a force, so otherwise it says uh, these are the, date, the details of the payment. Confirm, yes or no, you have to type yes, enter. Oh, okay. uh, with F it's just force, so okay. it's not important really. Yeah. So this is, it, this is how it works with, with all the invoices. So actually it's pretty simple, so nothing, nothing changed on the protocol level as, as explained. It's just like the timing is, is different, but I think what makes this interesting is the applications that you can do with this. So if I go back to the uh, slides, um, yeah, I think I explained most of the things here. Like the maximum hold, <coughs> I spoke about it briefly. So in the invoice you set a, a delta value, like how many blocks do you want to uh, still keep as a, as a recipient when you accept the, the invoice payment. Um, when, you get when, that, when, when blocks keep coming in and you get close to the expiry, you need to cancel because if you if you wouldn't cancel, then your channel peer will say, okay, you're holding this HLC, but you're not selling, you're not canceling, so I'm going to close the channel with you. So the maximum hold is defined somewhere close to the expiry of the of the HLC that you that you arrived. Uh, but you can control this, you can control this yourself by chasing that final CLTV delta in the, uh, in the in the invoice payment request. Okay, so applications then. So the refunds, I already spoke about this. Um, but another thing is uh, anti-DOS, fidelity bond, sort of. So what you could do is if you have a web service and you're worried about people dosing your service um, or be behaving in a bad way otherwise, you could ask them to pay to you a whole invoice for a really small amount. So you give them the payment request, they make the payment, they get some kind of a API key, and they can't start using their service. But if you detect like abuse using this API key, uh, what you can do is you can just pull their payment and then cancel their API key. So they will be punished with a chosen amount. Uh, it should be low enough probably for users to actually be willing to pay this, to trust you with this money. But for anti-DOS, <coughs> it's really low because the DOS, you probably need to generate lots of, lots of traffic. So you, if they don't behave well, your, your users, you will pull their money, and after some time, let's say you get close to the expiry value, maybe one day or one session, or it depends on how you define this, you can um, just cancel the payment, and then the, the user of your service didn't pay anything. So, yeah? Can I ask a question? How theoretically long could this huddle invoice remain? Uh, yeah. Indefinitely? Yeah, so um, it depends on the node software, really. So. Um, nodes can decide for themselves, like what's the maximum HLC that we want to um, forward, or yeah, so accept, it's, uh, it's still okay, they can accept any HLC that they want because it's not their risk, but once they start to forward, um, they get an instruction in the onion block, like how many blocks it sh their forward HLC should be locked, and they have their own idea about what they think is reasonable there. So in L&D, at the moment, we have like a hard-coded limit of, I think, 5,000 blocks, which is like pretty pretty long, really. Um, so, yeah, this is something to think about. I, if people are using like payments with 5,000 blocks uh, all the time, you, you don't maybe you not like it anymore after some time. So, um, it could be that this is something that sh can be communicated in the channel policy. So, currently channels they have a policy that defines like the minimum value that they can relay, the maximum value, the, like the fee to pay. So you could also say like, okay, we have a channel and there's like a maximum time lock for this channel, and maybe I've got another channel and uh, it allows longer locks, uh, but the fee is higher. But yeah, it, uh, the, the problem is that if in the end the payment is canceled, you will earn nothing in both cases. So um, for successful hold invoices, you could like adjust your fees to some expected time lock, but for canceled ones, uh, you would nobody will pay anything in the end. So basically you provided your service for free there. And then maybe for 5,000 blocks. So, but that's one application that is quite interesting because uh, DOS it is, it is a real problem. Uh, with, with this you can add a, like, <coughs> you, you can add some money into it, which it only needs to be a very small amount. It can be very effective in uh, deterring people from trying to use your service in a way that it's not intended to, while the normal user is also paying like a small amount, but it will be refunded at the end. 
so close to the expiry. So yeah, I think it's, it's quite interesting. Um, the other thing is like atomic swaps. Um, so atomic swaps, atomic means that uh, you you pay and you get something in exchange for that, and this is like an atomic operation that those two steps can't be separated. In the real world, it's not always completely like that, but you know, probably see what I mean when I start explaining these. So one atomic swap in the real world could be like a customer ordering a pizza. So um, what he could do is he could order a pizza on a website and he will get a lightning payment request from the pizza restaurant. Uh, but the pizza restaurant actually created this invoice as a hotel invoice and they don't know the pre-image themselves. So the customer pays this invoice and the pizza restaurant sees like, okay, I've got the payment for the pizza now. Uh, if I would have the pre-image, I would be able to get this money. And then the delivery person goes to deliver it and at the door, they ring the doorbell and he says, this is your pizza, can I have your pre-image, otherwise I won't hand, hand over the pizza to you. So this is pretty nice because the customer generated this pre-image, passed the hash to the pizza restaurant, and only in exchange for the pizza, it will give the pre-image. So the pizza restaurant knows that this person has the money because we are actually having it. And um, yeah, the person ordering the pizza knows for sure that he will only pay if he actually gets the pizza and maybe with additional requirements like it should be hot, for example. Um, and, and, and this thing can actually happen it can happen offline, so suppose you would order the pizza for tomorrow, you already pay the whole invoice, you take the pre image with you on a note, and then you go up somewhere high in the mountains, isolated place, and then the pizza is coming, okay, it's a little bit maybe artificial, but the pizza is coming there, and you just need to exchange the pizza for the, for the pre-image, and uh, the, the person delivering the pizza can actually calculate the hash of the pre-image to verify um, offline, don't need internet for that, whether this is actually the pre-image that uh, is connected to this pizza, and you can have your pizza there. And if they don't deliver because they think it's too high up the mountain, you pay nothing. So, yeah, I thought it's quite interesting. And uh, so the key differentiator there is that if you're, off, you're able to make a pizza, make a pizza, make a payment for the pizza, even though you're offline. That's the key. Difference because like I, I could I could pay for the pizza I could receive the pizza and pay the lightning payment as I received the pizza. Yeah, you could do that, it. but but then the pizza restaurant is not sure that you actually that you actually have the money. So, but it, because if you only but the payment wouldn't go through. Su suppose suppose you order a pizza and then he comes up to you and then you say sorry I have no money. Uh, so with the whole invoice you already paid, so. It's not a guarantee that uh, uh, the pizza restaurant will actually be paid, but you actually committed your funds to that pizza already. Cool. So it's a bit, <laughs> there's a bit more, and it's, a, so it's yeah. like a two-step payment. It's yeah. like you're putting the funds up. Yeah, it's almost like an escrow. Yeah, so almost. Yeah. Yeah, but you commit, but uh, the, the recipients can't uh, contact your money. They can't because they don't know the pre-image. As a customer, you generate your own pre-image. You only tell the hash to the pizza restaurant. So they know that those funds are there. So the, the commit is not, uh, doesn't force you to do anything you can buy? Oh, who's not forcing anything to do? When you pay, when you, you pay, you, you commit to the fact that you, you own uh, money. You, you own money. Yeah, know. right, yes. But doesn't, uh, it doesn't constrain you to do anything. Yeah, it, it, that, okay, so once you, uh, you've, you've paid the hotel invoice, that money is not available anymore for other things, so it, it's locked during that time. Yeah. Um, yeah, but of course, if the pizza comes to you and you say, I, I don't want it anymore, I don't give you the pre-image, yeah. yeah, there is still a conflict, but like the number of different types of conflicts that can happen uh, is, is lower, because the thing that I have no money at all, that's, that's, not, that's not possible anymore there. And you, and you can do the same thing with three parties, it's almost the same, almost the same. So uh, there's a sender and he sends a parcel to a, a recipient. So what he could do is, um, so let me explain this in the right way. So the delivery service uh, creates a, a whole invoice for the, the cost of delivery. And it, the whole invoice is paid by the sender, but the delivery service doesn't know the pre-image, so we can't pull. And then um, 
they need to go to the recipient of the parcel. The recipient of the parcel doesn't need to pay anything, uh, but they do have to, the pre-image. So the delivery service want to get paid for the delivery, so they go to the recipient and they ask for the, the pre-image because if they don't get the pre-image, they don't get paid. Um, and when they get the pre-image, they can prove to the sender that they actually delivered the parcel because they can show the pre-image, so the recipient must have given the pre-image to them. And uh, yeah. So it's almost the same as the pizza. There are only there are three parties involved. So the party paying is a different party as the one who's receiving the, the package. Uh, yeah, so and the third thing is it's almost like a chain of ACLCs in Lightning, but then in the real world. So here, here are again three parties involved. Um, there's a customer who orders with a web shop, there's a web shop who sends the product using a delivery service, and the delivery service is delivering uh, the customer. So the customer pays the web shop with a, with a pre-image, so the web shop doesn't get the money. Uh, then the web shop pays the delivery service with the same uh, hash, so tied to the same hash, but the delivery service also doesn't know uh, what the pre-image is, so nobody paid anything yet. Then the delivery service goes up to the customer. The customer sees that, okay, this is indeed the product that I ordered. Um, it will give the pre-image to the delivery service. The delivery service wants to get paid, so they pull the money, they reveal the pre-image to the web shop, and the web shop is actually pulling the money uh, for the product from the, from the customer. Um, well, it's not completely trustless because uh, like the delivery can be much cheaper than the product itself, so people can, could, can steal things along the way. But the whole idea of like um, opening up the chain by revealing a pre-image by the customer, um, yeah, I, fi I find this quite interesting. So I'm not sure how soon this will be adapted, but uh, these are constructions that you can't easily make with traditional payment systems. Like there is more trust involved, there's more like refunds going on, and here. Um, the customer, you know, they know that if I don't release the, the pre-image, nobody is, can take my money. So nobody is holding it custody at the moment, in custody at the moment. I only release it when I get the product that I really need, that I really ordered. So from the customer perspective, it's, yeah, it's pretty safe. So. Um, to me, it sounds like a prepayment or something like that. Uh, yeah, it's a prepayment, but uh, with a prepayment, uh, are you get, will they give it back to you? So in this case, it's also indeed a prepayment, but they can't just take it. So you can decide yourself when, whether they actually can get this prepayment. Could you give them a <coughs> pre-hash? They don't have to cash it in yet, and they can just cancel the pre-hash. So what do you mean with pre-hash? Uh, the pre-image. Um, the pre-image. Yeah, if you give it to them, uh, well, they can take the money whenever they want. So but they don't have to. They don't have to, no. Now, which I just showed in the demo, like you've got these two commands, uh, LL and CLI settle and LL and CLI cancel, and you can use them to either cancel or settle, if you, even if you know the pre-image. So. Yeah, I think this is pretty good for like, um, kind of, it's kind of like the feature that credit cards have, right? With the charge back. Yeah. Yeah, so like, instead of sending cash and not being able to retrieve back, it, like, this gives an option for you to retrieve the money back but it's split up differently than uh, the credit cards. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think with the credit card, there's some kind of a 30-day something to, to do it. While here, uh, you can decide not to pay, but once you reveal the pre-image, the deal is done also. So that's uh, maybe a bit more strict and also easier for, for merchant to know, like, okay, I actually delivered, now I've got my money, and I don't need to wait for maybe another 29 days to, uh, if something, you know, is not according to the customer's liking, and he's going to refund anyway or back charge back. Yeah. So, and then in the in the online world, there's also an application. It, I don't know if we talked you talked about this already, but uh, Lightning Labs they offer a service called Lightning Loop, and you can use it to ref to to basically change the balance of your channels. So, in Lightning, if you open a channel, uh, you are the only one funding this channel, and all the balance of this channel is on your side. So you can send payments from that, uh, but you can't receive. In order to receive, you first need to send, which is sort of not very intuitive for people used to like regular, like on-chain or fiat or all kinds of payments. So maybe normally there's not really a limit to what you can receive. It's not a problem to receive money. So in Lightning, that's different. You open your channel, and if you don't do anything else, you can't receive. And Lightning Loop, uh, there are two variations of this. There's Loop Out and Loop In, but the Loop Out one 
yeah, allows you to push balance out really. So what you do is you've got a channel, all the fans are on my side, and I can decide to push half of what's in this channel to the other party. And because after I after I do this, I'm actually able to, to receive through this channel because there's balance on the other side and uh, they can forward payments to me using that balance. Um, so you could just make a donation, so you get, you pay a random person some money and then you've got your balance, but then you lost that money. And uh, what Loop does is, is actually, it. so what Loop does is it, it takes this money from you and it refunds it to you on chain. So you send a lightning payment and then it loops back to you via an on-chain transaction. And um, in Loop Out, we're also using hotel invoices to make this trustless. So the way this works is that you make that off-chain payment to, to move the balance in your channel, but the Loop server doesn't know the pre-image of this payment. So it, it, holds the, it, it holds the payment, but it doesn't know the pre-image. Then it's going to publish an on-chain transaction. Uh, it's also a hash-locked uh, contract. And then the user of the service can sweep that money to its wallet, but in order to sweep it needs to reveal the pre-image. So what the loop server does is it watches the chain, it sees that its transaction is getting spent, it looks in the transaction, it uh, figures out what the pre-image is and it uses to it to pull the off-chain, yeah, to pull the off-chain payment. So that makes the service trustless and um, it, it uses whole invoices uh, to do so. Um, yeah, there's another example um, uh, which I heard of, I think it was demonstrated at uh, Lightning Hack Day in Munich. It, it is an auction. Um, I'm not completely sure if I tell it right, but I, I, I do get the, the idea how this should work. So there's an auction, people need to bid. Um, but if you bid, you like the, the auctioneer wants to know that you actually got the money. So he creates whole invoices and people are paying those whole invoices. And when a higher bidder comes, like the lower bit is cancelled. So how I would think this would work is like there's some QR code on the screen, people can scan this, they can they can send their payment, and uh, you see like a blocking screen, nothing is happening. So it probably means you are the highest bidder at that point. Then someone else comes in, he overbids you, and then you see your payment failed, like it says payment hash, so you know that you need to pay more to get to, to, to win the auction. So also quite interesting. Um, then you've got in, in the gaming area, this is uh, a person called Mandelduck, and he created a game. It's a two-person shooter, really, uh, where you have to place bets, and the person who shoots the other, also here, yeah, maybe I'm inventing a part of it, it's not completely how it works, but it could work like that. The person who shoots the other uh, gets the bet. And uh, what you don't really want, uh, ideally, is a gaming server that is holding all that money of all those bets. And what you can do with HODL invoices is that you have those two players send a HODL invoice to each other, but both of them are unaware of the pre-image. So they commit the bet to each other, and nothing's <laughs> happening yet. Then they play the game through a game server, uh, and the person who wins will win the pre-image that allows him to pull the money from the loser. So the game server is not holding any funds, it's just knowing pre-images and revealing only one when the game uh, is, is, is finished. So, yeah. So you're trusting, you're trusting the server to assess who's the victor and then release yeah. the pre-image to the victor? Yeah, but as I understand that those games, they, they often use a game server anyway that, that, that enforces the, the rules of the game. Um, but there are no, there's no actual money being, being held there. So. Even the height of the bed could be like unknown to the game server. It's just a very, it's a very similar scenario to like the, the two of three escrow, or that's all I'm thinking about. Yeah. And, but, but it seems more flexible. Yeah. Right. Like, what, which the two out of three scenario? Like a two of three multi sig. So like mm -hmm. on chain, if you're trying to do something similar, you would in the betting scenario or in the buying a pizza scenario, you'd pay money to a two of three multi sig. All oh, right. You and could then one of those, one of those keys would be the. I see. Yeah. The, uh, the, the yeah, that's not similar. Only this is like instant on chain. Is well, we all know the problems with on chain. You know, like what fee to choose, waiting for 24 hours, what to confirm, etc. So, it also, it also seems more flexible. For some it doesn't. It's not just like a one-to-one -one mapping. It seems. It seems an improvement on the two or three. Side. 
There's yeah. only two people. Huh? There's only two people. Uh, I suppose there's only two people, but you're still relying. You're still relying on the server to provide the information to determine who gets the pre image. Right. So they're not directly involved in the funds in terms of like having a key to the multi sig, but they're still providing information that determines who gets the pre image. Yeah. So one one fine application. This is something that I have been experimenting myself. I don't know if you know the lightning torch. Has it? You know lightning torch. So the idea was we are passing along a payment that increases in value every time. And I thought I also want to be part of this history. So <laughs> I, created the, I created my invoice for the lighting torch, but I actually made it an HODL invoice. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to accept the, the torch, and then I want to look, okay, who's my successor? I want to get a, an invoice from, from that person. I pay that invoice first, so I know that, okay, I passed on the torch and only then pull the money. So if for some reason I couldn't find like a next person, then I could cancel the payment. I could say like, okay, I have nothing to do with it. You know, I accepted the money, but I, <coughs> I canceled it back. And it could even be such that in this case, I knew the pre-image myself, but that the next carrier of the torch only knows the pre-image. So I could, you could do like a trustless hop. It's not that, that lightning torch is anything like that's happening all the time, but what you could do is if there's one person who you don't really trust, I think this has happened, that someone stole the torch or two people stole the torch and in the end they gave it back. So if there's someone you don't really trust, maybe he says he only five followers on Twitter, so I don't really trust it. So can you do a whole invoice and tell me who the next person is and you give the premiums to the next? So he can be part of the torch, but uh, there's no way for him to steal the money because he can only get the premiums once he's paid himself and then pull the incoming payment. So it's not nothing really practical, but just a funny fact. I did guess. you do that as part of the lightning talk? I did it as part of the lightning oh, talk, wow. yeah. So, so you were one of the participants. OK, so there's whole invoice as part of the lightning talk. Yeah, yeah. It's very cool. Yeah. Who was the person you didn't trust after you? Hmm? Who, was, who was the person who you didn't want to trust after you in this chain? Lightning torch chain. Mm, yeah, there was enough nobody who I didn't <laughs> trust, but it was just like they just, they just I, just, five followers. I just wanted to, you know, promote my own invoice. <laughs> I guess I thought maybe I can use the lightning torch as a vehicle to do so. <laughs> yeah. All right. So how how we time wise, Mr. Good or? Uh, yeah, we're still good. Okay. So okay, some concerns. Some of them we already spoke about. So. If you have a whole invoice, you need to watch uh, that timeout because L and D in this case is not not going to do it. So if you create a whole invoice, someone pays it, and you just don't act there, your channel pair will at some point close the channel, close the channel with you, and cancel for you. So that's something you don't want to let happen. So if you create an application that builds on whole invoice, you need to make sure that you keep up with blocks, uh, know when your whole invoice is. Uh, need to be decided on. So either cancel or settle, both is fine. But you need to act. It's not going automatically. So um, do we close it on chain? No, not no. On. Just, the, just that, that payment. Uh, for that particular HLC, you need to decide to cancel or settle off chain in that, yeah. Because otherwise it goes on chain and then it will be cancelled. So if you cancel the whole channel on chain if, if the HLC gets held up for too long? That is what your peer will do. So in general, this has nothing to do with holding invoice, but if you... Yeah, so I was getting, my next question was going to be, so for a regular payment, if the HTLC gets lost and you don't receive an error message... You are enough, going to close your channel. Your node might close down your whole channel on chain. Well, you're going to close yourself even. So if you extend an HTLC, it's actually your friends who are on the line. Oh, so okay. when you get close to the expiry, uh, you know that, okay, um, it will soon happen. So and once it happens, you immediately publish a transaction to reclaim your funds. Mm -hmm. And uh, you do this on chain because if your peer is not responding anymore, you can't make the commitment dance, uh, like update the commitment transaction off chain. So that's what you want to do. But if you are the receiver of, a, of an HLC or like the receiver of a, a payment to a HODL invoice, your peer will exhibit this behavior. So they will watch that height. And when uh, your expiry height gets close, maybe 10 blocks before or so, they will start. Yeah, they will start closing channels, so you need to be aware of that. It's not the end of the world if your channel closes, you're not losing any money or so, but um, it does it does cost a bit, like you need to reopen it again. Maybe this is a channel with like a, a long history, a year old channel, 
uh, I heard that other implementations also start to work like channel H into their pathfinding heuristics. So they favor all channels. They say they have sort of proven that they could remain open for a while, so probably more reliable. So there are things, some things to say about not letting a, a channel get closed. And something that we want to do ourselves is to create some kind of a automatic process there. So when you get, when you get close to the expiry, um, ideally LND should cancel the invoice for you because it will be canceled anyway if you don't act. So you can just as well cancel it yourself just in time to prevent channel closure. So how the application is dealing with this, that's another thing because if the application still thinks that uh, it's being held, the money is still with you. You go out to bring the pizza, you get the pre-image and you come back home and you can't claim the money. So the application should still be aware of this, but this is like a safety precaution to prevent unintended channel closes, at least. So the other concern is like feedback to the sender. So I, I showed in the demo, you make a payment, nothing is happening, so you don't know what's going on. Is it ever going to happen or, or not? You can't also not send it again. So at the moment, um, yeah, you pretty much rely on having like an external channel communicating to you that it's, that everything is okay. Um, whether something will be added to the protocol, yes, no, it's still, still in the discussion because um, what do you do with situation again that you pay, but then the acknowledgement of that it actually was accepted is not receiving you. So in some way you're always pushing forward the problem. In the end, someone can always say like, I never, I never received it. And there's no way, no, no way to prove it. So I'm brainstorming a little bit about this, but the workaround for now is to, to make do it on a website or via some other protocol. Just tell the user you're good. The payment is with us. So yeah. Just out of curiosity, um, what about hash locking the product in some way? For example, I want to sell you software, and we have this setup. Um, you do the bond. I lock the software, decrypt the software. Uh, in such a way where the pre-image is used to decrypt, or some, some type of fancy, and uh, you, you, once you open the software, the, the bond gets paid because you reveal the pre-image. I'm not sure if that's... Uh, yeah, only then the one who sells the software. So, uh, yeah, I'm not sure how that, how, how that would work really, I, because... <coughs> There's probably something in there with encrypting with, 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 with pre-image, but I'm not sure if it will work in, in, in that case, because as a buyer, I get the software. I have to pre-image myself. I can unlock the, the software. Right. I can never tell the, the shop what the pre-image was, so. Right. Right. Um, yeah. I suppose you also don't know if you, like, you know you've got, you know you've received some software, but you don't know if it's the software that you sought to buy. Right. Until you've actually decrypted it and been able to look at it. Yeah. Yeah, so um, one other concern is that locking up of liquidity. We already talked about it a bit, but there's there a 20x leverage, really, because a, a route in Lightning it can be 20 hops. So if you create an old invoice yourself and then you pay yourself through a 20 hop route, like all those nodes along the route, all those 20 are committing the capital with the payment. You can try to use like the maximum accepted expiry, so 5,000 blocks for example, or maybe it's a little lower, but still a lot. And then you just do nothing. So with your one BTC, you've locked 20 BTC of the network that can't move during that time. So yeah, it's something that you can do at the moment. Um, it is to be seen like how this develops. Is Currently conditions are really friendly on the network. There's not much adverse behavior going on, uh, but it is a factor that, uh, that does exist. And uh, it's difficult to defend to, uh, against, so you can lower your maximum acceptable time lock value. Um, but even then, after it expires, the attacker can send out the same thing again with a renewed HCLC. So, yeah. I have no answer to that. I don't know how that's going to develop. But I'm sure you considered this, but what about um, parallel HCLC? So you want to do this HODL invoice. I know it's a HODL invoice. You tell me it could be seven days to, let's say, one to seven days, for example. Right? And I say, great, I'm going to charge you 10 Satoshis per hour. And I would like a parallel HTLC where every hour you pay me. And as soon as you stop, and Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that has been discussed as well. I need to have some kind of a parallel channel to do this. Yeah, you would think in the end you need such a thing like if 
people can lock up so much money for free, uh, there needs to be some kind of a monetary compensation for that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, one, one other problem um, is failure attribution. So failure attribution is like if you make a payment, it can either be a successful payment or a failed payment. Uh, it may not be ideal. Like an, a failed payment is never ideal because you don't want a fail, failed payment. Uh, but a successful payment can also be not ideal if it was, for example, slow. So it could be a non-hodl payment, uh, which was slow in the end. So there is there, there's one, there's one node that holds the payment for, let's say, a day. And, but in the end, it still relays the result to you. So during this day, you don't know what's going on. You make the payment, you hear nothing back. Um, maybe if you're at a bar, you ask for a new invoice to get the beer, so you pay another invoice. And then after one day, you finally get a confirmation and it says payment settled. So you <coughs> actually pay twice. So this is also a non something that you don't want. It's also non-ideal. And then you've got like failed payments uh, that also have a delay. So you hear nothing back and after a day, it is a failure. Um, with a specific message, and uh, a failure has a like a source normally. So every failure is signed by the sender of the failure, but it doesn't necessarily need to be the person who delayed. So it could be that a node uh, generated a failure, and then along the backward path, somebody delayed this failure, and then it gets in the sender. The sender only sees like this is when I sent it out. This is when I got it back. I don't know really what happened. Um, it is already a problem, but if you also add into this mix all invoices, it becomes even more unclear where the delays are actually happening. So this is only a little bit related to all invoices, but this is something else I'm working on at the moment. It's like investigating options to, to improve this, so to get more feedback. If you make a payment from where did it get stuck, um, which node delayed it, and do this in such a way that nodes can't really avoid a judgment of the sender, and once you know the node that caused the problem, you can apply penalty, and if you apply penalty, it won't be as likely that you will use this node, this node next time. But whole invoices is a complication there, because not every slow payment is a non-ideal payment. If the recipient actually caused the delay, it can be, it can be okay. Okay, yeah, this is uh, last last slide. Um, atomic multipath payments. So, have you been spe speaking about this, about multipath payments? Yeah, yeah. right. Um, so, you could already do now sort of a non atomic multipath payment. So, non atomic in the sense that the recipient doesn't need to wait for all the uh, shards of the payment to come in. But what you could do is you can make a whole invoice and then you make multiple payments to this whole invoice and they will all be hodled, really, so nothing has paid. Um, and when the uh, recipient sees that, okay, now I've got enough, they are all connected to the, to the same hash, I can supply the pre-image to the node, and then everything gets pulled. So it's a, it's a, it's a non-atomic it's, it's non -atomic multipath payment, so each of these shards can take uh, different paths, but the same difficulties apply there, such that um, the sender doesn't really know whether its shards actually arrived or are stu stuck along the way. Um, yeah, and also currently, with LND, it's not possible to pay to the same hash twice. So if you would want to simulate this, you would actually need like different nodes that can all pay to the same hash. The sender has, the, has its total invoice. It will accumulate those payments. It also doesn't really know what the total is, so there are a lot of you know, rough edges there. But the basic idea of a non-atomic payment uh, could be could be could be played with a little bit in that in that way. The only thing there is that. The receiver doesn't know the pre-image of those until the very last shard. So the idea is there that that last part of your payment contains an encrypted a pre-image that can be used to to unlock to, to, to unlock the others. There's some crypto going on there, but that's like the basic idea. So we are making payments. Uh, the receiver can only pull all of those payments when it receives the last the last one of that of those. Yeah, I think this is what sort of what I prepared for for whole invoice. Cool. So. so we'll do questions on whole invoice, and then we'll open up to questions on anything. So, uh, any questions on the presentation? I have a lot of questions, but I 
anyone wants to jump in, just to cut me off. Good, right. um, so yeah, so you, f you must be familiar with purse.io or companies that uh, let users sell stuff online. Um, and typically those companies, you deposit Bitcoin with the company. Uh, and that company acts as a third party escrow. Um, so um, I, I see. Do you feel that that would be the most obvious use case of just re re getting rid of um, the whole third-party escrow and just using hard invoices for online payments? No, I, I, I wouldn't dare really to say how this is going to develop. I just see the, the possibility there, but the workflow of a customer generating a hash, passing it to the um, passing it to the to, to the web shop, and then the web shop starting the delivery process without really having the money yet. At the moment they get paid first and then they deliver. Well you say with purse is different, so there's an escrow in between. Yeah. And yeah. sort of um, to follow up there, uh, could I borrow something from a person with a hodl invoice? Like I say, um, uh, I would like to borrow your car. And you say okay, but let's put some money in escrow in the event that something happens with the car. Did you see some way we could do that? Yeah, you would still need to have, maybe if you have a, like a third party, because there needs to be like a arbitrator there to decide you know, if there's a problem or not. So if there's only two parties, it won't really solve this problem because then you pay the bond. But if you still have the pre-image, you bring it back with a dent uh, and you say, I didn't do it and I don't give you the pre-image. It isn't exactly the same as when there is a third party, but possibly that third party can then decide, can, can keep that pre-image and then decide whether to release it or not. a good system for trial periods. You can try something for 10 days, and then uh, if you don't cancel, the payment goes through. Yeah, it sounds, sounds like it could work for that. You were saying this would be used for cross-chain atomic swaps as well. It's, it's uh, yeah, for the loop out. So loop out are these uh, submarine swaps. They are also called like that. Uh, we, we use it there indeed to um, first get the off-chain payment from the user and then only once the user received the on-chain payment they disclose the pre-image and we use it to pull the off-chain. What if it was hash locked but not time locked, right? Such that if the channel yeah. closes, like no one gets the money. Like yeah, so that is but you generally, nobody really wants to hand out a hash lock, and a hash lock contract which is not time locked because then if your peer disappears, the money will be lost forever, really. Right, but let's say it was just me and you, there's no hops. Yeah. I'm doing this, uh, uh, and you that's... Still, you still need the time lock, even in a, a payment chance. Yeah. But you can set it to like a really high value, so it's almost the same as if there wouldn't be a time lock, but. Uh, it is a risk because you really need to trust the other the other party to actually uh, yeah pull with the hash at some point or off chain cancel. Right, but if the cancel button disappears, you've got no way of getting to something. What if we did this? I borrow your car. Your car is worth a thousand dollars. You make me bond two thousand, and uh, and there's no time lock, but. Um, what we do is, if I wreck the car, you want $1,000, right? And we've locked up 2000 And so we negotiate from there where it's like, listen, if you don't want to pay me, it just, it's just hash locked forever. But then I lose 1000 from the car, and you lose 2000 But if you unlock, then we can negotiate where I'll give you $1,000 back, but I get that $1,000. Like an over-collateralized situation. But the one who pays this risk actually risks two thousand at that point. Right. So one of them's got more at stake than the other. So like, it's not an even negotiating position because one of them's one of the parties has more to lose. Than the other. So you kind of got some bargaining. You've got a stronger bargaining position. Than the other. Right. You said this won't this won't be. Um, This won't be the ability for LND to monitor the hodl invoice won't be um, 
integrated anytime soon. Do you have any thoughts on how that could work, where I don't have to monitor the time lock outside of LMD? LMD does that for me. Yeah, now, how that could work? Um, we just need to build it, like some kind of a piece of code that is triggered every block. It goes through all the invoices. It looks for the ones that are close to expiry, for which we don't have a pre-image, and then and cancel them. Uh, but it isn't really a solution because, in the end, those HLCs are held for a reason, and the application that is holding them also needs to to sort of act. So basically, if this happens to you, it's actually like a sign that uh, something is not right in, in the application or the uptime of the application or the design of the application, because the application should keep track of those and you know, act on them, on them in a timely manner. So whether it's when it's built, whether it's included in L&D or not, will not just be whether people see that there's a use case for it. That it's also a trade-off in terms of like the the attacks that it opens up by including it within L&D. Yeah, it's not really an attack because uh, it, it's just automating something that you could also code yourself, yeah. really. Um, and in general, like. There's so much work to do, everything, everything needs to be prioritized. And so we thought, okay, with this whole invoice as it is now, people, people can do what we think they should be able to. And then like this automatic, automatic cancellation is sort of an add-on on top of it. So it needs to compete with like 20 other things we want to do, so yeah. So just a, moment, just a case of priorities rather than yeah. uh, concerns over whether it should be merged into the other deal. Yeah, definitely, we have a really small team, so uh, yeah, too much work. Any other questions on Holland Invoice? If not, we'll open up to questions on anything, or lightning specific, uh, lightning labs, LD. Uh, any any questions that I can answer? Now's your chance. Yeah. So just broadly, so this is kind of both lightning and, and, and Holland Invoices. Um, do you think that uh, the narrative around why lightning is useful is a good narrative? Because right now, a lot of it's like, oh, it's micropayments. But what you're talking about here is much more interesting than micropayments, at least from my point of view, where it's much more diverse. And uh, yeah, what, what do you think? The like, what is exciting about about Lightning? Okay, for me, like the other I like it because it, they are new use cases. But for me, like a basic payment is already pretty exciting uh, because it is a way to get around like the <laughs> chain limitations. Really, that's the main thing for me. So fees and confirmation time, uh, scalability in general. Like I see Lightning, I've got my, I, I've got one channel and uh, we've got a meetup locally where I live. And then every time I go there, I can use my same channel to, to pay over and over again. And there, there, there are people there, they pay on chain and they're complaining about fees and about conf times. And then yeah. the people from the payment processing are there as well. So they're accepting zero comps, but not with IBF because otherwise people might. So there's lots of stuff going on while with Lightning, the whole experience becomes a bit becomes much cleaner and faster and cheaper. I mean, so from, from my perspective, it's, it's not even about the micropayments. Micropayments are just what, the only way to do it. If you want to do micropayments, you just can't do it on chain most yeah. of the time. But that's like, all, all these things are above micropayments. If you want to send a thousand dollars, lightning is... But we talked about the benefits of lightning earlier. It wasn't yeah. just micropayments, right? Yeah. It was like instant, uh, instant transaction. So there, 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 yeah, there's a place for, for on chain as well. If you want to send one million dollars, for example, you need huge channels uh, that probably charge big fees. And with on chain, there's like a fixed TX fee, so there's a there's a amount at which it becomes more attractive to to do it on chain. Um, so Luke and Luke out earlier. Um, why can't we just open to? Two channels, two different places, with everything on your side, and then send half each channel. You, you, you can't, both channels can't receive, so you can send out through both, but they can't receive. So you would send out to the one, and you can't go into the other. Yeah. So basically, you could also do this in person, really, to to, to really explain. Like, I could I, I I could send ten dollars to you, and you give me ten dollars cash. Mm. So then I've changed the balance of my channel. I can yeah. start receiving. Uh, but this loop is just a way to do this trustless uh, with a on-chain transaction to bring the balance back to zero. Is there a, where is there, where's a good explanation of that? Uh, there's a blog post on the Lightning Labs blog okay. about uh, Lightning Loop Out. <coughs> so Loop In is available currently on Testnet. So we are working to release that for, for Mainnet as well. 
Yeah. So loop out is available and loop in is... Yeah, only testnet, loop out is for mainnet. So if you've got a node and you need perceived capacity, uh, maybe because you want to try out, can I be a routing node? That is some things people want to do. You could create a channel to the destination of your liking and then loop all of it out mm -hmm. so you can start receiving through that channel. And this is also quite a difference with other serves that exist in which you actually buy a channel. So you've got these services where you can you pay and they open a the channel to you, mm -hmm. but you will get that channel from them, which means that um, people paying to you through this channel and you yourself paying through this channel uh, will be subjected to the fees that they charge. So I could sell you a, a channel for not that much money, but then I could start charging 10% of everything I forward to you. And this is something you might not want, like you don't want to do this to your customers, for example, having only one route that is so expensive to them. And also once you receive the money, at some point you want to send it out yourself again, and you're also going to pay those forwarding fees. So if you buy a channel, you also need to look at whom am I buying it from? What is their policy? And of course, policies can change, but uh, services might also build a reputation at some point. When th th these are the fees that we charge and uh, we guarantee them for this long, for example. Um, and another aspect with choosing your channel peer is uh, how well they are connected themselves, because it doesn't really make sense to buy a channel for someone who's not really connected at all. So you've, you bought a channel and still people can't pay through, to you through that channel because your peer is not well connected. And with loop it's different because you open a channel to any peer you like, so you can just loop up on, you've got this list of probe destinations or 1ML as some kind of a metric for node, uh, I don't know, node rank I think it's called. Um, you open to any one of those, uh, you can look at their forwarding fees, you can try to figure out how they are connected, <coughs> then you open the channel and you push out all your balance and you can start receiving payments. So it's kind of different, like in a way more decentralized because people can choose all their own peers. While if you have three services that sell channels and everybody is buying channels from those three services, those will become like pretty central. Yeah, yeah, central nodes. Well, I've got a couple of questions. On. So you did a presentation on routing at Breaking Bitcoin. Yeah. I've got questions on routing. So one is, so LMD currently uses Dijkstra's algorithm, right, for routing. Yeah, right. And Sea Lightning uses uh, Bell Cord. Mm. I think they recently changed it, but okay. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm assuming there was a discussion at some point where it's like, okay, these are the routing algorithms that we could possibly use, and we're going to use this one rather than this one. Was, or is that a discussion for a later day? Yeah, well, I was not involved in it. when I joined. It was already decided and implemented. But Dijkstra is a pretty logical choice uh, choice for this. I think Bellman 40 advances that you can actually have ne negative weights. So in Dijkstra, you need to every edge needs to have a zero or positive weight because otherwise you might have been get into loops. It keeps keeps on looping. Um, it can happen in any case that, that that you get into loops with negative weights because there could be a route that makes it cheaper and cheaper and cheaper by going around. But if that is not the case, uh, Bellman Ford is able to deal with those negative weights. And the idea about these negative weights is that negative costs is that you could actually encourage people to route in a, in a different direction through your channel. So that would be the idea. Like if you've got a channel and you want to get it more balanced, you can attract like four people uh, to use your route by offering a negative fees. And that is, is an idea, but it's not really happening at the moment. Like you can't even communicate it in the protocol at the moment that you're charging negative fee. But that would be a reason to, to use Bellman for it. And another thing to be aware of is that uh, Dijkstra itself is, an, is optimal. Uh, but you need to use it in the right way. And um, what we've been doing in LD at least is we've adding more constraints to the route, constraints like a maximum fee and a maximum uh, time lock that you can specify during pathfinding. And if you uh, specify those constraints, Dijkstra is not optimal anymore because uh, if you only, only choose like the lowest cost all the time and then you run into a limit, it is not going to backtrack at that point, uh, even though it really should to find the optimum solution. Actually, the, the space to explore, it really explodes with all those uh, with all those limits. So currently, we just accept it as a limitation of Dijkstra. It's also a trade-off with execution speed because we don't want to make it too slow. But uh, we are aware that the way we currently use Dijkstra is, is, is yielding like a suboptimal sub -optimal, sub -optimal results. So is, is the... Is the long-term goal to do like a blended approach of Dijkstra and the reputation system? Uh, it, is, this, it is already a blended approach because Dijkstra is 
optimizing a cost. And this cost is for us not only the forwarding fee that you pay, but it's a combination of the forwarding fee, the time lock. So we favor routes, everything else being equal, we favor routes that lock up your money for a shorter period. Uh, and then in addition to that, we factor in a probability. So this uh, is what we recently merged. So there is a reputation management system that keeps track of previous payments. Uh, it analyzes the outcomes and it tries to estimate the probability of every channel succeeding if used in a, in a payment attempt. And then if you multiply all those probabilities, it will give you the route probability. So the pro because for a successful payment, every step of the route needs to succeed. So we multiply probabilities. And uh, this is factored into the cost, and this is more like an abstract cost as well, and that is used in Dexta to, uh, to optimize the path. So that's, a, that's building a local local view of the reputation of nodes yeah. that you're connected to. Yeah, the way it currently works is that it's... It's, it's, it's only based on the payments that you've tried or the probes that you've personally done. Yeah, so everyone is on their own, so they all build, build their own uh, reputation database really. Um, which is kind of inefficient, you could say, but decentralization is also important to us. But it will be interesting to see how this is going to develop, because we are now also uh, storing that data, maybe creating something to export it, so it's only a small step to people saying like, okay, I made one million payments, you can have my data set, so you can bootstrap your node. So it will be pretty interesting to see how this is going to uh, work. And maybe also uh, supplement the learned probabilities with some external data, <coughs> someone tells you, like, this is a good node, I can add it to my whitelist somehow and it work into the probabilities and then uh, it, it propagates through to pathfinding and we will use that note more often if, well, it's not much more expensive, for example. Like a 1ml.com API? Yeah, it could be that they supply some kind of a list, but it's always the centralization argument there. Do we want to connect to a server, server that provides us with all the info? But this it could be competition. It wouldn't have to be. It could, 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 could be multiple. Indeed, you could make multiple and you weigh it. And, uh, yeah, this we are it's so early days. Really, if you think about these kind of things, like before this merge, like L and D would only keep reputation for a single payment, and then for the next payment, you know, it would just start all over as if nothing happened. So we are extending this now. We made it configurable, so you can actually say, like, I want you to remember how to for an hour, or I want to remember for two weeks. So it, you can tune how aggressive it should prune the graph based on your, your, your observations. Uh, but this is yeah, really just a start. And what's also an interesting question is how important this will be in the end, because currently the network is, is everything pretty new, everybody is you know, trying to find out how to run a routing node, but maybe at some point everything gets more professional, nodes will stay up much more, and routing is not that important anymore because everything Everyone who offers their services uh, and is profitable just, um, yeah, guarantees a, a minimum, like, service level, and then it doesn't matter that much anymore. Yeah. Same could be said for the size of the graph. So, currently you can open a channel and you can say it's public. Your channel pair will just accept it; they, they don't care. Um, this is all advertised, so the graph becomes pretty big. Like all these channels are advertised, but you know, I've got a public channel for my phone and. Um, Nobody can route through it, you know, my app is not even running and it's just polluting the graph and uh, by the time, and I also tried to convey this in my, in my break Bitcoin talk, um, by the time that senders are actually become more, more demanding in terms of node uh, performance and uh, nodes will start to realize that accepting public channels from someone you don't know is actually a risk to your own uh, revenue, your own forwarding revenue. Because if you ac accept a channel, you're going to advertise it. People are going to try to use it to get their payment through. And if it doesn't work, in worst case, you know, they penalize you for a month. And if lots of people are doing this, this public channel is going to bring down your reputation and your profitability. So it's interesting to see how this is going to develop. Like the, the senders increasing their, like their expectations and sending this uh, through controls in their reputation management system. And on the other hand, nodes seeking profitability and stepping up their game, increasing their the, the level of service that they uh, that, that they offer. And I think it, it needs to go slowly uh, because if you, as a sender, would now demand like perfect execution every time, you know, you would blacklist the whole network and you would never get any payment through. So, but it, it's an interesting dynamic to see how, how these two things will go hand in hand. And, uh, and now in LND, we added some parameters where they can be used to, to tune reputation management. 
But of course, we don't really know what people set this to. So we have got a default, it's one hour, but maybe people start setting it to a week or so. And um, yeah, it's also a little bit out of our own control. Like, how is this going to be used? And people will seek an optimum value to, to make payments. So they want it to have as aggressive as possible, but not uh, if it would lead to like huge fees being paid because there are only two reliable nodes that charge like 5% forwarding fee. So it's not just the reputation of your own node you've got to worry about, it's the reputation of the peers that you choose to connect to. Uh, because that's yeah, going to potentially... Definitely. If you advertise a channel, uh, you will be held accountable for it. In the end. What are the downsides to minimizing the number of hops out of curiosity? Because I feel like the more hops you have, the more possible. Yeah, yeah so every hop uh, is a risk that something goes wrong. So the, the like the fewer hops, the better. Uh, but also every hop adds another additional time lock because they, they, they receive an ACLC, they hand out an ACLC, and they require some delta in between for their own safety, like that they not get into a situation that the next peer pull the payment and they are too late to pull theirs. So every hop that you add, adds something to the time lock. And in the happy flow, it doesn't really matter what the time lock is because you know, it will be sold instantly. But if it's not a happy flow, there's a node that just disappears from the network. It will be locked for that number of blocks. So yeah, so there, few ops is better in general, unless you want to really obfuscate what you're doing, possibly. So. That's not much visible, but if all the hops on your path are from are, are owned by the same person, you can really trace so where your payments go. What are your views on balanced channels? Uh, should you aim to, to keep it generally 50-50 unless you have specific information otherwise? I know Alex yeah. Boswell has talked about keeping it at least 25-75 ratio. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, well, it, I think this also this connects to what I said before, like senders dictating the rules really. So if a sender says, I expect nodes to keep their channels between 25 and 75, so I will only search for paths that ut utilize a maximum of uh, let's say 25% of the channel capacity. So if, if the balance is between 25 and 75%, I should always be able to send a payment of 25% of the capacity. Because even if it's 25 or 75, there's still enough reserve to actually forward this. So I could modify path finding. Currently, if a channel is, let's say, 1 BTC, I try to route 1 BTC through it, but the chance of this actually working is really low because if it's, the balance is different than everything on one side, it will already fail. So if you would change this to only pick channels that have a capacity at least four times as much as the payment that you want to send. Uh, then we expect from nodes to actually keep this 25-75 balance. And if not, so if they repeat, uh, respond to us with a failure, we just blacklist the node for a whole month again. Uh, we as the sender are, have the power to actually shape the network, like shape the rules that nodes need to comply to. So, so you, don't actually, you don't actually know what the inbound outbound capacity ratio is but you're, set, you're, you're setting that expectation yeah. that if I send this amount that you're able to route it. And if you aren't, then you're right. going to blacklist you. And but I don't actually, at any point in time, I don't actually know that inbound outbound capacity. You, you, you don't know, but you, yeah. you, just, you just expect them to have a 25% reserve yeah. at all times. And you could say like, okay, this is a waste of liquidity really, because there's like 25% tied up in that channel that's never used, but maybe that's the cost of reliable payments in the end. They could just be unlucky. They could just get a lot of payments routed through them in one direction. Yeah, but then they, they might want to open multiple channels to make sure that like there's always you can always find solutions to be sure that you always deliver successful payments every time. Yeah. Uh, it's just what's the cost of that? Like it's obviously the cost is lower if you just fill some payments now and then, so you can use the channel all the way down to to yeah close to zero. So cool. Any other questions? No? Okay, well, let's thank you guys for coming in. You didn't have to.